I invite you to turn in your Bibles to the book of Revelation, and we will continue our study of that magnificent book. Revelation chapter 2, we'll be looking this morning at verses 18 to 29. This is the letter to the church at Thyatira. I have entitled this message, The Tolerant Church. Tolerance in our day is a virtue. We are told to be tolerant lest we be intolerant, which would be a heinous crime. Intolerant people are akin to fascists, extremists, problematic people that get in the way of love and fairness and everybody just getting along. Tolerance as a virtue in our culture is designed to just let everybody be who they are. And Jesus addresses a tolerant church here at Thyatira in the first century. And it's not a compliment. A tolerant church here is under severe indictment from the Lord of his churches. Let's read together Revelation chapter 2, beginning in verse 18. And to the angel of the church in Thyatira write, The Son of God who has eyes like a flame of fire and his feet like burnished bronze, says this, I know your deeds and your love and faith and service and perseverance and that your deeds of late are greater than at first. But I have this against you, that you tolerate the woman Jezebel who calls herself a prophetess, and she teaches and leads my slaves astray so that they commit acts of immorality and eat things sacrificed to idols. I gave her time to repent, and she does not want to repent of her immorality. Behold, I will throw her on a bed, a bed of sickness, and those who commit adultery with her into great tribulation unless they repent of her deeds. And I will kill her children with pestilence, And all the churches will know that I am he who searches the minds and hearts, and I will give to each one of you according to your deeds. But I say to you, the rest who are in Thyatira, who do not hold this teaching, who have not known the deep things of Satan, as they call them, I place no other burden on you. Nevertheless, what you have, hold fast until I come. He who overcomes and he who keeps my deeds until the end, to him I will give authority over the nations, and he shall rule them with a rod of iron as the vessels of the potter are broken to pieces, as I also have received authority from my Father, and I will give him the morning star. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. We will follow this morning the same outline and pattern as for the other letters to the other churches we've looked at. We will see a salutation, a commendation, a confrontation, a command, a promise, and a plea. Let's look first at the salutation. This is the greeting. Again, this is from Jesus to the church at Thyatira. Look at verse 18. To the angel of the church at Thyatira write, the Son of God who has eyes like a flame of fire and his feet are like burnished bronze, says this. This is the longest letter of the seven and it is written to Thyatira, the city we know the least about. It was not an important city in its own day and on top of it sits a town. It's impossible for archeologists to get underground there and so not much is known. It is 40 miles southeast of Pergamum And again, we have the slides on the screen so that you can see Paul was banished again on the island of Patmos, and he looked across that strip of water uh, to the area called Asia Minor, that Roman Roman province, modern-day Turkey, where these seven churches are situated. And this city, Thyatira, 40 miles southeast of the city we looked at last week, Pergamum. And you can see these are all on that circular road. All the mail, all the government business, all the trade went to Ephesus first and then around this circle. So here we are at Thyatira, the fourth church in the circle, the fourth receiver of a letter from Christ. And these letters are really remarkable things. We, we talked about these letters being something of an audit, 
an ecclesiological audit, Jesus taking inventory of the state of the church, the one who knows minds and hearts, who sees every motive, who knows every secret, actually giving an assessment of churches in the first century. What were they like? What were their strengths? What were their weaknesses? Could you imagine getting a letter from Jesus about the state of your heart or the state of the church? These churches had that privilege. What we do know about Thyatira is there was not much pressure there for emperor worship. It wasn't a significant part of of where people went or didn't get much attention from Domitian, the emperor, in this time. And so we don't have a lot of record of of emperor worship being of much pressure there, nor a hostile Jewish community. And so it seems the church at Thyatira did not face the same kinds of external persecution that some of the other churches have faced. But what was a big deal in Thyatira were the trade guilds. They were more numerous there than in any other city. And there were trades that proliferated there and they organized themselves according to guilds. There were wool workers and linen makers and clothing makers, leather workers, potters, slave dealers, and bronze smiths. And it was with these trade guilds that came the significant threat to faith at Thyatira. For in Thyatira, in order to be successful in life, you had to belong to one of these trade guilds. It was something like a union. They were a a union-only city. Each trade guild at Thyatira had a patron deity. In order to be a part of the trade guild, you had to pay honors to the deity of the trade. And the trade guilds each held festival dinners where they honored that patron deity. And at those dinners was food sacrificed to the idols, followed by parties of sexual immorality. And you had to participate in these activities to be a guild member in good standing. So what would the church do? Would the church compromise with the culture in order to enjoy personal prosperity? Would they trade holiness of life for a higher standard of living? Notice the second half of this greeting. The Son of God, who has eyes like a flame of fire and his feet like burnished bronze, says. This is the way Jesus introduces himself to the church at Thyatira. And like all the other letters, Jesus' introduction appeals to that vision of Christ that John received on Patmos back in chapter 1. Notice verse 15 of chapter 1. His feet were like burnished bronze when it has been made to glow in a furnace. And in verse 14, his eyes were like a flame of fire. Both of these depictions of Christ are appealed to here in this letter to Thyatira. He is first called Son of God, an indication of his deity. None other than God himself is assessing this church. And with eyes like a flame of fire, Jesus is the one who scrutinizes the church. This is a picture of his omniscience, his impenetrable gaze. Nothing escapes his view. He sees everything that goes on. And for his feet to be like burnished bronze is a picture of the brilliant purity of refined metal. But this burnished bronze comes right out of the fire. It is glowing and hot from the furnace. And this Jesus who would walk among the lampstands, whose very presence would be amongst his churches, would be one whose feet would carry the intimidating, glowing, brilliant picture of the one who is present among his churches and assesses their spiritual capacities. What would be Jesus' assessment of this church? We come first to the commendation. That is in verse 19. This is where Jesus assesses the things the church is doing well. Look down at how Jesus commends this church. I know your deeds, he says, even your love and faith and service and perseverance and that your deeds of late are greater than at first. And again, for Jesus, the omniscient one, the one with the fiery gaze to look down in his church and to say, I know, has the twin realities of comfort and accountability. It's comforting to know that the things you've done for Christ, 
though unseen by others, unknown by the world, things that others might not even care about, are precious to him. They are important to him. He sees them. Nothing goes unnoticed. And Jesus commends very specifically their deeds. The list of their commendation is fourfold. He says, I know your deeds, and then he describes four categories of those deeds. Love, faith, service, and perseverance. All of those are modified by this possessive pronoun, your. It is your faith. The ones Jesus is commending here have a personal faith in him. They, they lean on him. They depend on him. They believe him. Their love, and, and think about the letter to Ephesus. Jesus told the church at Ephesus they had abandoned their first love. They had taken a sad departure from the love they had at the first. Not so with the ones commended here at Thyatira. They still loved Christ from the heart, and that love was manifesting itself in the kinds of things that marked a honeymoon state of affection for Christ. And he says, I, I know your service. That is, their faith and love weren't merely private things between individuals and the Lord, but it worked itself out in actual, tangible ways of service to one another in the body of Christ. And he says, I know your perseverance. Perseverance means to bear up under something over time. They endured. They were those who experienced some levels of hardship, and yet they were faithful. And Jesus says your deeds of late are greater than at first. He's indicating here that this commendation recognizes growth and maturity and upward movement in their following of Christ. This list of commendable traits is longer than any other commendation in any of the other letters. And so it sounds like the church must be doing rather well. But sadly, this commendation list did not mark the church as a whole. It marked, as we will see down in verse 24, a remnant within the church, but not the church in the majority. These good works that Jesus recognizes at the church at Thyatira were confined to a small portion of the church. And so while there were some genuine believers at Thyatira who walked faithfully in the Lord, and they were growing, the majority came under the searing scrutiny of the Son of God in a confrontation. Look down at verse 20. But I have this against you, Jesus said. It's a terrifying statement. I have this against you, that you tolerate the woman Jezebel, who calls herself a prophetess. She teaches and leads my slaves astray so that they commit acts of immorality and they eat things sacrificed to idols. I gave her time to repent. She does not want to repent of her immorality. Behold, I will throw her on a bed of sickness and those who commit adultery with her into great tribulation unless they repent of her deeds. And I will kill her children with pestilence. And all the churches will know that I am he who searches the minds and hearts. I will give to each one according to your deeds. The problem at Thyatira was a problem of syncretism and compromise. They had syncretized with the surrounding culture. That is, they had taken some little bits of Jesus and going to church and Christian living and they had amalgamated it with the things of the world. They were living as though they were not transformed by the gospel. They were fully and thoroughly thyra tyran. They were not living as new creatures. They were not living as transformed ambassadors to a lost and dying world. They had learned to live comfortably in their world. And they had done so on pragmatic grounds. In other words, it, it wasn't emperor worship. It wasn't Domitian with a, a giant club and a sword saying, call me Lord and Savior, call me God, as happened in other cities. And it wasn't the Jews, the synagogue of Satan, who sort of excommunicated Christians and then put them under the ban from the Roman Empire. 
It wasn't a hostile community ratting them out. What caused the Thyatiran compromise was sheer pragmatism over a standard of living. In other words, to be faithful to Christ would have meant not being a part of the trade guilds. It would have meant not being able to have as good an income as otherwise. The Thyatiran Christians here had gone full-fledged into idolatry and immorality out of the pragmatic compromise of keeping a job and keeping an income at a certain level. Imagine, imagine that your business every year holds a convention in Las Vegas. And to do well in the company, you have to go. You, you must be part of the union and attendance at the convention is mandatory. And when the business end of the convention is finished, a massive banquet is served with the best food and entertainment all paid for by the company. The most expensive foods and the most exquisite foods from all over the world are brought in in an endless train. And each delicacy from all over the world is described according to its place of origin. And it's been dedicated to the deities and the religions of those places. Statements are read, honoring the religions and the gods of each locale as the foods are served as a matter of respect for the culture of origin. Each pagan deity is respectfully acknowledged one after the other as each part of the meal is served. During the meal, raucous entertainment is provided. Musicians, dancers, comedians, and performers provide provocative performances catering to base sexual lusts. And when the meal is over, the diners are provided with escorts, prostitutes, paid for by the company to gratify the desires of those in attendance. What will the follower of Christ do? Offend the CEO? Be considered prudish and puritanical by your coworkers? Insult the manager? Sacrifice contracts and customers and commissions? It's a dilemma. It's a dilemma over lifestyle and compromise or faithfulness and impoverishment. Now imagine that at church you hear sermons week after week after week about how God wants you to be happy and successful and prosperous. Your blessed life now. In fact, one of the teachers of the church goes to the conventions every year. And, and you know what goes on there. We're under grace, she says. God wants you to be happy, she teaches. If the system requires you to compromise a little, God understands we're all broken. And besides, if you're making it financially, God must be happy with you. You might be confused a little, but you know, she's still at the church. She's still teaching. The, the elders haven't corrected her. Nobody's disciplined her out of the church or removed her. She, she's still there, so it must be okay. Besides, what happens at the trade guild festivals stays at the trade guild festivals. Or maybe you're not confused at all. Maybe your conscience isn't bothered. Maybe you think it's cool that Christians aren't stodgy, weird killjoys that don't know how to have any fun. You're kind of impressed that you're around a group of people that are with it. They're in the world, they, they know how to have fun, they, they have Jesus tatted on their arms and their hearts in the gutter. It's all good. Well, it's not good at all. Look at Jesus' indictment in verse 20. I have this against you. You tolerate the woman Jezebel. This Jezebel was evidently a prominent woman in the church and a teacher. Her parents probably didn't call her Jezebel. It's a pseudonym. A number of times in the book of Revelation, Jesus gives another name to a well-known person or place. Men are called beasts. Cities are given other names. In fact, the city of Jerusalem, at one point, Jesus calls Sodom and Egypt. It's not that Jerusalem moved. 
It's just that Jesus is assigning character traits to his beloved city because of its faithlessness. And here a woman in the church is assigned by Jesus the name Jezebel. Notice her activities. She calls herself a prophetess. That is, she makes a claim to direct revelation. She says to God's people, I'm hearing from the Lord and you need to listen to me. It, of course, is a false claim. And Jesus is exposing it here. But just think about the audacity to say, thus saith the Lord, when the Lord hasn't spoken. Don't you know you'll meet him one day and have to give account for those words? What boldness to try to speak for the Lord contrary to his heart. She calls herself a prophetess. And then notice, she teaches, verse 20. She teaches. Listen, this is disobedient from the start. You know 1 Timothy 2.12? Women are not to teach in the church or exercise authority over the church. At the very beginning, at the very foundation, the fact that she is exercising this teaching authority over the church is wrong. It's wrong from the start. It's wrong for her. It's wrong for the leadership of the church. It's wrong for the church. This is why Jesus says, you tolerate her and I have it against you. And then he says, she leads my slaves astray. Don't miss the replacement of authority and the direction. Jesus says, they're my slaves. Listen, you Christian, to be called a slave of Christ, that's a term of endearment. You were a slave of sin. Sin wanted to kill you, take everything precious from you, and lead you to hell. Jesus rescued you from slavery to sin and said, now you're going to be a slave of righteousness and he gives you eternal life. And in order to bring you out of one slavery and to bring you into the sweet service to Christ, he laid down his own life, took on the form of a slave to do it. Christians, we we don't recoil at that culturally offensive word when it comes to our relationship to Christ. You mean... The one who knows me better than, knows, than I know myself. The one who always have my best interest in mind. The one who corrals the entire universe, Romans 8, 28, unto my good. Even my enemies have to bow the knee to Christ to bring about my good. He lets me be his. It's an unspeakable privilege. And Jesus here says, they're my slaves. And Jezebel is leading them astray. Listen, Jesus is a shepherd who loves his sheep. Wolves come in. Beasts come in. False teachers leap the wall. And Jesus will have a reckoning. She subverts the lordship of Christ. She tells Christ's slave what to do. And what she tells them to do is to run away from him to their own destruction. Notice as next, she encourages idolatry. She leads my slaves astray so that they commit acts of immorality and eat things sacrificed to idols. She entices them to sinful behavior. She leads them by teaching and by example. And by the way, any time a, a Christian leader normalizes sin, it has a compounding effect of making sin easier for others. Oh, if so-and-so Christian leader lived that way, I guess it's okay for me. And listen, we're all responsible for our flesh in that moment. But let not many of you become teachers, my brothers, for you will incur a stricter judgment, James 3.1. This is serious business. And she leads them to commit acts of immorality, and she leads them to eat things sacrificed to idols. This is serious. 
You think about the Jerusalem Council in Acts 15, and, and the church is trying to figure out, okay, we got Jews and we got Gentiles. Gentiles are coming from uh, uh, pagan idolatry backgrounds, and the Jews are totally stay away from idolatry, but now some Gentiles coming to the God of Israel are really sensitive about anything having to do with idolatry, so what do we do? And at the Jerusalem Council, they just said, stay away from things sacrificed to idols. And then Paul in 1 Corinthians encourages the believers to, to think with some significant nuance about things sacrificed to idols. They are to be careful to remember that an idol is nothing. There's nothing to an idol. There, there's only one God. And so if, if somebody is bowing down to a stick or a stone and, and putting some food in front of it, the, the idol's nothing. And, and the food dedicated to the idol, it's still just food. And so if you're in the market and you're buying tri-tip, don't ask where it came from. Just buy it and eat it, medium rare. But if somebody tells you, hey, this is Zeus and it was sacrificed to Zeus, it's dedicated to him, and eating it, you're worshiping him, you don't eat it. And if it offends your conscience, don't violate your conscience. And if eating things your brother knows is sacrificed to idols in front of him violates his conscience, be vegetarian. And so there's, there's all this nuance about thinking rightly about food sacrificed to idols. And what's going on here is this Jezebel character is leading God's people knowingly to participate in the worship of idols at these guild festivals. This is not just, I went into the supermarket and I didn't know and I ate it and it was good. This is, I'm going to the guild festival and I'm going to participate in the festivities. And they are devoted to the patron deity of the guild. And with that comes all of the immorality. And she's teaching them to do it. This is a scandal. She is a stumbling block. And calling her Jezebel is shocking. Some people's crimes are so historically heinous that the names sort of drop out of use. You know, Brutus... Judas, Adolf, Jezebel. But Jesus applies to her the name Jezebel to take us back to the scene in First and Second Kings. I want you to turn to First Kings 16. It's important for us to just remember the historical figure. Because the believers at Thyatira and the so-called Christians at Thyatira were supposed to be shocked by this. And you know the phenomenon of the frog in the kettle. The, the water gets warm, the frog is swimming, the heat is turned up, the water gets warmer, and the, the frog doesn't notice the change in temperature until the frog is boiled and dead, and then it still doesn't notice. As culture slides and, and the church is like the frog in the cultural pot of boiling water, the church becomes like the world. And, and that can happen incrementally in ways we don't notice. Jesus saying, you're tolerating Jezebel in your church. Would be like Jesus coming to the church and saying, hey, one of your favorite Bible teachers is Adolf Hitler. Do you understand the shock value? That's what Jesus is doing here. 1 Kings 16, verse 25. Omri did evil in the sight of the Lord and acted more wickedly than all who were before him. Different Omri. Okay, this is the bad king Omri of the Bible. But... Omri was king over the northern tribes, and for God to say Omri did more evil than all who had been before him is quite a statement. And we won't back up and read about all the evil before him. It was monumental. Verse 26, for Omri walked in all the way of Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, 
and in his sins in which he made Israel sin, provoking Yahweh God with Israel in their idols. It's quite a statement. God is provoked by Omri's sin, who walked in Jeroboam's sin. Jeroboam was the prototype of, of all the northern kingdom idolatry. Now look down at verse 28. Omri slept with his fathers and was buried in Samaria, and Ahab his son became king in his place. Now Ahab, son of Omri, became king over Israel in the 38th year of Asa, king of Judah. Ahab, the son of Omri, reigned over Israel and Samaria 22 years. Ahab, son of Omri, did evil in the sight of Yahweh more than all who were before him. So who was the worst? Omri. Who was worser than the worst? His son Ahab. He was bad. Look down at verse 31. It came about as though it had been a trivial thing for him to walk in the sins of Jeroboam, son of Nebat. (laughs) All of that was bad. What's worse than that? That he married Jezebel. She must have been a piece of work. (laughs) Jezebel was the daughter of Ethbaal, king of the Sidonians. And Ahab went to serve Baal and worshipped him. He erected an altar for Baal in the house of Baal, which he built in Samaria. Samaria was the new capital that Omri had built for the northern tribes. So right there in the capital is government-subsidized Baal worship, straight out of Sidon and Ethbaal, king of Sidon, through his daughter, Ahab's wife. Verse 33, we discover that this provoked Yahweh more than all who had gone before. In 1 Kings 18.4, Jezebel hunted down the prophets of Yahweh. At first, it was syncretistic. Some Baal worship, some Yahweh worship in the land, that's all right. But eventually, we must silence the word of God. And she silenced the word of God with the sword. She put to death Yahweh's prophets, hunted them down to snuff them all out. In 1 Kings 18, you have that Mount Carmel showdown where Elijah is the only representative prophet of Yahweh at the scene against all the prophets of Baal. They're all on the government dole. They all eat at Jezebel's table. That is government-contracted pagan idolatry and immorality. And and you know the scene there that all those Baal worshipers are are in a rave, probably a a, a drug-induced, blood-letting rave trying to get influence and interaction with the demons behind that worship, trying to bring down fire on the altar. They, of course, were unsuccessful because God was in charge. Yahweh, the one true God, and a demonstration that he is truly the God of Israel, burns up all of the wood in the altar. In 1 Kings 19, Jezebel seeks to kill Elijah personally. And then in 1 Kings 19, 9 and 10, you hear Elijah's complaint. Do you remember it? I'm alone. There's no one left. The whole government's against me. And God assured Elijah, no, I have kept thousands for myself who have not bowed the knee to Baal. Chapter 21, you have the story of Naboth's vineyard. Turn there. King Ahab was sad because he couldn't have someone else's stuff, even though he was the king of Israel. Look down at verse 5. Ahab was vexed. Jezebel, his wife, came to him and said, How is it that your spirit is so sullen and you're not eating food? He said to her, Because I spoke to Naboth the Jezreelite, Give me your vineyard for money, or else if it pleases you, I'll give you a vineyard in its place. He said, I will not give you my vineyard. And Jezebel, his wife, said to him, Do you now reign over Israel? Arise, eat bread, let your heart be joyful. I will give you the vineyard of Naboth the Jezreelite. What does she do? She conspires and has him murdered in order to steal his stuff. This is a wicked woman. In chapter 21, verse 19, you have Ahab's death prophesied as a judgment of the Lord and then fulfilled rather strikingly three chapters later or two chapters later in chapter 22 when a random arrow flying through the air pierces him in the chink of the armor. And then randomly, his soldiers transport him to the very spot where God prophesied the dogs will lick up your blood. 
And then Jezebel's death was prophesied. Look at chapter 21 and verse 23. Of Jezebel, Yahweh spoke, saying, The dogs will eat Jezebel in the district of Jezreel. Skip ahead to 2 Kings chapter 9. Speaking to a subsequent king, Jehu, Yahweh says, You will strike the house of Ahab, your master, that I may avenge the blood of my slaves, the prophets, and the blood of the servants of Yahweh at the hand of Jezebel. And then look at verse 10. The dogs shall eat Jezebel in the territory of Jezreel, and none shall bury her. That's the promise. And the promise fulfilled in verse 33. Jehu came to the gate came to the building where she was upstairs and he called out, anybody on my side? And two or three of the officials peered over the edge. They're standing there with Jezebel and he calls up to her and Jehu says, throw her down. And those who allied themselves with Jehu threw her down. Verse 33, some of her blood was sprinkled on the wall and on the horses and Jehu trampled her underfoot. And when he came in, he ate and he drank and he said, See now to this cursed woman and bury her, for she is a king's daughter. And here the king gave a command that contradicted the Lord's prophecy. Jehu said, Bury her. God said, None's going to bury her. They went to bury her, verse 35, but they found nothing more of her than the skull and the feet and the palms of her hands. Therefore they returned and told him. They said, this is the word of Yahweh, which he spoke by Elijah the Tishbite, saying, in the property of Jezreel, the dogs will eat the flesh of Jezebel, and the corpse of Jezebel will be as dung on the face of the field in the property of Jezreel, so they cannot say, this is Jezebel. Nothing left worth burying. It's gruesome. This is a judgment of God against a wicked woman. It's shocking. It kind of sounds like the last days of Adolf Hitler. It's just an awful life with an awful ending. And Jesus says to the church at Thyatira, yeah, you're okay with her being a Bible teacher. You tolerate her. I have this against you. This was supposed to shock them. Jezebel historically was a pagan worshiper in the land of Israel, an enemy of God's word and a destructor of God's people. And notice what Jesus says about her. I I gave her time to repent, verse 21. And Jesus, the one with the searing eyes of flames of fire, sees through her and knows she doesn't want to repent. He knows the heart. Mercy of Christ to give her time to repent, and he knows she will not. Perhaps she was confronted by the Apostle John. Perhaps she was confronted by some in the church at Thyatira. But she would not step away from her false prophetess role, from her teaching error, from her being a scandal to God's people. But Jesus knew her, knew her condition, knew what a threat she was to his people. And he says, verse 22, I will throw her on a bed. Uh, And my Bible says on a bed of sickness or a sick bed. The word here is used of a a funeral bier, kind of an old word we don't use very often. Uh, It's a pallet that you carried a corpse on. It would be kind of like a funeral procession with a coffin, except no walls and no ceiling, just the body there on a flat platform carried through town on the way to the graveside. It's irony that he says of her, she has committed adultery and I'm going to put her on a bed. It's a contrast. It's a contrast from her bed of adultery to a deathbed unto eternal punishment. And notice verse 22 I will also give great affliction to those who follow her teaching, to those who commit adultery with her. Not only the the physical immorality involved in adultery, but the spiritual adultery of faithlessness to Christ, all of it bundled up into one here. 
And then notice the merciful warning here in verse 22. Jesus says, unless they repent of her deeds. They are practicing what Jesus calls her deeds. And what a kindness of the Lord. There is a time when God's mercy runs out. But as Romans 2, 4 says, don't despise his patience, not realizing that God's kindness is intended to lead you to repentance. And notice, they must repent of her deeds. There are professing Christians at Thyatira who had become Jezebelian, and they must turn. Look at verse 23. Jesus says, I will kill her children with pestilence, and all the churches will know that I am he who searches the minds and hearts, and I will give to each one of you according to your deeds. Her children here, I don't believe are physical children, but spiritual progeny. They are her disciples, those who have embraced her message and have become like her, those who champion her cause and who are enslaved to her vices. And Jesus says, I will kill them with pestilence. This is a judgment. And then he says, and all the churches will know. This situation in the church at Thyatira in the first century was to be a public example like Nahab and Abihu in Leviticus 10, or Ananias and Sapphira in Acts 5. And, and what will the watching world know? That Jesus knows, he sees the secrets of the heart, and he cares about the purity of his church. They will know that Jesus scrutinizes his people. And Jesus says, I will give to each one of you according to your deeds. Here Jesus individualizes his scrutiny for every single one of us. We know that these letters are applied to churches throughout history and churches in our own day by that final concluding plea, let him who has ears to hear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. This brings immediate application to us as we read these words. Jesus knows, Jesus sees the fiery scrutiny of the flame of his eyes. We'll see to it that everyone is rendered according to his deeds. We don't escape his scrutiny. And Christians here are not off the hook because they were under bad teaching. Teachers incur a stricter judgment, James 3.1. But every Christian is to be like the Bereans who cross-checked the Apostle Paul from their Bibles. Every Christian stands alone before Christ. You have God's word in your language, Christians in the 20th century in America. And you are accountable for the truth. And you can't hide behind, oh, I was in weak churches, I had bad teachers. They'll be held to account, a stricter account, but, but all of us believers are accountable for the truth, to live by it, to believe it. Let me give you from this section of Scripture some red flags on teachers. There are a lot of teachers, a lot of people out there that claim to speak for the Lord or, or represent His thoughts, His heart, people that claim to teach God's Word. You should know that they are not endorsed by Jesus if their lives are marked by immorality. If their lives are marked by idolatry, a syncretistic compromise with Jesus and the Baals. Another red flag on teachers would be those that are unqualified. For someone to hold an office a shepherd, pastor, overseer, elder in a church. It's a very specific list of qualifications. Qualifications that address the heart and life of those who would aspire to shepherding work in the church. You can read those in 1 Timothy 3 and Titus chapter 1. And for someone to hold authoritative teaching role in the church, they must be qualified. A red flag for a teacher would be that of untethered character. To be publicly known in this Jezebel's case for not only participating in pagan festivals and idolatrous immorality, but leading others to do so is a clear indication her life is out of control, untethered to the Word of God. 
and then simply to violate the Bible's instructions on how to do church. Let's be blunt. Someone who says, 1 Timothy 2.12 is not in my Bible because I cut it out. And women should be teachers is off the map. If you're going to do God's work, you have to follow His instructions. And this isn't a matter of men being better than women at anything. And you men know this. But it is a matter of following God's instructions for the way he sees to operate his church. Not every man should be teaching, by the way. Qualified men, handling God's word accurately. And then someone claiming to represent God with new and special revelation. She called herself a prophetess. And listen, it's one thing to just say, oh, I've got some ideas, you should listen to me. It's another thing to say, you should listen to me because God is talking to me in a special way and now that has authority. That is doubly dangerous, particularly for her. Our TVs are full of people who make that claim. And then someone who would profess the Lord but deny by his fruits. Titus 1.16 makes it clear that a life that belongs to the gospel will live in keeping with biblical truth. And then this little phrase, the deep things of Satan. This is a remarkable statement and, and we haven't gotten to sort of a, a command to the remnant yet. But Jesus will tell them, you've done a good job by not going after the deep things of Satan. There's a perspective that has been throughout church history and, and rears its ugly head from time to time that where, where Bible teachers will say, for you to truly know the truth, for you to really go after deep things, you need to experience them. And apparently there was a bold claim at Thyatira of knowing the deep things of Satan. And there was a remnant of Christians that said, I'm not going anywhere near that. That sounds a lot like a tree I wasn't supposed to eat from in the Garden of Eden that that snake told me to go get. And yet this teacher led them into those things. And then she seems to have appointed herself. She calls herself a prophet and she teaches and she leads. Anybody who says, yep, I'm going to lead you, self-appointment is a red flag. And then just giving Christians message that they want to hear when their hearts are attracted to worldliness. The whole idea that you can have Jesus, you can claim Christ, you can be a part of his church, and you know what? If you have to make a few compromises here and there to maintain a standard of living, go for it. Everybody does it. It's fine. Or the, the subtle, nearly half-truth that says God wants you to be happy. Well, of course God wants you to be happy. That's what the word blessed indicates in our Bible. There's lots of promises of blessing for those who live faithfully, but Jesus' definition, description, and pathway to happiness are far different than that of your flesh or that of the world or that of Satan. And as the world would define happiness, one who comes along and teaches, you can be happy by the world's standards and have a little Jesus. Following Jesus is going to make your life better. Jesus intends to give you the best that the world has to offer. There are teachers in churches today who advocate divorce, unbiblical divorce and unbiblical remarriages, who condone sex outside of marriage, and the teachers themselves have done these things, and the churches ignore the scandal, or they reinstate the leader after the headline in the paper is forgotten. And all of this under the banner, God wants you to be happy. Teachers that will not teach the whole counsel of God's word. Teachers that are afraid to indict sin in the church because, look, how are we going to get people here? How are you going to get sinners to come into the church if, if we talk about hard things like the cost of following Christ or the need of daily repentance? If we teach holy living and hold each other accountable... Nobody's going to come to church. And so they just stick to talking about the blessings. 
And the church at Thyatira had a problem. The, the problem was a false teacher. Jesus called her Jezebel. But the church had a bigger problem than that false teacher. The church tolerated her. That was a heart problem for the church. The church, in its majority, welcomed her syncretism and her pragmatism. It would call itself a church. They would say they were on Jesus' team, but it didn't have to take a stand against the world. They were in the world, and the world was in the church. You could follow Jesus. It's a whole lot easier when it didn't cause you to be an outcast and an enemy every time you turned around. Listen, false teachers only get a foothold in the church when the flesh of those in the church allow the foothold. Look, and it's a cheap trick. A teacher comes in and says, hey, you can indulge your flesh and Jesus will continue to smile on your lives. Who doesn't want to hear that in the flesh? The false teachers know what they're doing. That leads to the command of verse 24. And this is directed at the remnant. Look what Jesus says. I say to you, to the rest, the remainder, who are in Thyatira, who do not hold this teaching, who have not known the deep things of Satan as they are called, I place no other burden on you. Nevertheless, what you have, hold fast. This is directed at the remnant. This is the first of the seven letters with a subpopulation addressed within the church. These are the ones left unaddressed by that searing indictment. They they don't hold Jezebel's teaching. They they, they didn't fall for the, hey, come know the deep things of Satan. Then you'll be really spiritual. They didn't fall for that. And Jesus says, I place no other burden on you. No other burden than what? Than to hold on, persevere, and resist. Don't give in. Be faithful. Listen, they didn't have the world as their opposition, these faithful Christians, so much as their own downgrading church. Can you imagine the pressure? You show up at church on Sunday and everybody around you is compromising? That would be a severe temptation. And Jesus says, hold on. And the promise of his own return was an incentive to holy living, to perseverance, and to no compromise. And think about it. Thyatira didn't have Second Baptist Church. They had the Church of Toleration on the corner of Fourth and Main, and there wasn't any other church in town. What are you to do? Maybe you've been in a location where the only church available was a church on a downgrade. That's a tough slog. Jesus is with you, He knows your deeds, He says, Hold fast till I come. But this warning, you you tolerate the woman Jezebel, would have a certain sting to it if you had a choice. If you had opportunity to be faithful and be fed, to to go somewhere else. I, I would suggest to you that if you're in a church that does not press for personal holiness, that does not hold Christians accountable to their profession of faith, that does not proclaim the whole counsel of God's word, that conforms to the norms of the word, that platforms unqualified and ungodly teachers, you are in danger and you should leave. Jesus commanded the remnant church at Thyatira, probably the only church in town, is not an endorsement of you, Christian, remaining in and tolerating a compromised ministry when you could do otherwise. In our circumstances today, you likely have a choice when it comes to churches. And it is not worth endangering your soul for the sake of comfort, ease, or pragmatism, or permission for the flesh. There's a promise here from Jesus in verse 26. To the overcomer, to the victor, the one who keeps my deeds. He says, he will reign with me. Look what he says, to him I will give authority over the nations. A reflection is 2 Timothy 2.12, if you endure, you will reign with Christ. And he will rule them with a rod of iron as the vessels of the potter are broken to pieces, as I have received authority from my Father. This promise is a promised participation with Jesus in his authoritative reign in the millennial kingdom. 
You might think, man, he's quoting Psalm 2. This is the authority of God's Messiah to smash the nations with a rod of iron. Why do I get a rod? What's that all about? This is similar to the expansion of the promises that Jesus gives to those who follow. Remember Genesis 3.15? That that very first promise after the fall, God says, the woman will bear a seed, a son, and he will crush the head of the snake. And when you get to the book of Romans, Jesus said, if you're with me, I'll put Satan under your feet. Interesting. If you belong to Jesus, you reign with him. The the head of the snake gets crushed under your feet with Jesus who crushes the head of the snake. Again, unbelievable privilege for the nobodies who faithfully follow Christ over and against the crowd that compromises. This is wonderful incentive to stay close to Christ and be faithful. And notice Jesus says, I will give him the morning star, a reference to Revelation 22, 16. Jesus himself is the morning star there in that passage. What does it mean? You get the kingdom, and best of all, you get the king. You get to know him, belong to him, be in his presence. To the Thyatiran remnant, comfort. You might feel alone in a compromised church. Jesus sees, hang on. Don't compromise. And then this letter closes with a plea. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. I pray that this church never resembles the church at Thyatira, but it could. Many of you here in this room have been in churches that taught the Bible for decades. You've been in churches that were known for teaching the whole counsel of God's word, for practicing church discipline, for preaching difficult truths that did not equate to material blessing, and those churches grew. But somewhere, churches slipped. Some people that take the Lord seriously, while the church as a whole compromises, find themselves increasingly alone in a downgrading church. Church history is chock full of once faithful churches that gradually or suddenly embrace the world. Churches can do that because they want to fill the unauditorium. Churches can do that because they're tempted to think, how will the world ever listen to us if we're not like them? And Christians who like being worldly rather enjoy it. We must pray, we must labor, never to be as Thyatira. Again, those seven churches in Asia Minor, they're they're not still there today. They've all gone off the map. What should you do? Pursue personal sanctification. Pursue corporate sanctification as a church. Long for, hunger for the whole counsel of God's word. Don't tolerate bad teachers. Take great care in leadership selection. I'm gonna close us in prayer and the band will not come up. We'll just dismiss and you can sing on your way out the door. (laughs) Let's pray. Heavenly Father, it is with much trepidation that we read these words. We feel our own weakness. We feel the slippery slope that is each of our hearts. Oh, given the right circumstances, we would compromise. We would be drawn towards temptations of the flesh or pragmatic considerations about standards of living. Oh, God, keep us from such things. Lead us not into temptation. Deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom forever and ever. Amen.